Hello, everyone, and welcome to Integration Down Under September 2023 webcast. The organizers of Integration Down Under are Martin Abbott from Perth, Dan Toomey from Brisbane, Mick Badrin from Sydney, Wagner Savara from Auckland, and myself from Melbourne. And tonight we have Mateus talking about cl cloud security. Uh, I've known Mateus for a while uh, through the uh, MVP program. And let me just unmute him and we will hand over to him. Perfect. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. You're welcome. And I will and leave, I will you, leave to go. you to go. Perfect. Then I will add some slides into this as well. And there we go. So today we're going to talk about security. And uh, the idea of today's talk is actually talk a little bit of focus on uh, What's in it for me? Uh, and with that, I mean from a developer or architect perspective, more or less. Uh, we will use a little bit of storytelling and we will use a little bit of actual things that has happened and also some statistics to build all this up. So that's what we're going for today. And uh, if you've ever seen me before, I will use my pen as always, my best friend when it comes to presentations. But uh, let's start off with kind of building up what we're talking about. So we as people uh, working in a team, uh, regardless of roles, uh, we need to up our game a bit when it comes to security when, uh, in the cloud. And I think it's a big mindset thing, how, how we're thinking about security, how our role comes in what we're doing, uh, I think that's important for us to, to understand. And that is the idea of this talk. Because if we look into some statistics, uh, this was from 2022 from IBM. And um, 45% of, of all the breaches occurred in the cloud. That's a huge number. And I would guess that this has increased even more uh, as time goes, because it's a, an attack vector that they will use. Uh, and even if we talk about breaches, it's hard to kind of grasp what's happening. And therefore, we also want to add in that this is a costly thing. So do, having a breach is really costly. And it's really bad for business, because it both costs money, and it's also costs reputation, and it costs credibility, and you also lose speed, because you need to kind of go back and look into what has happened and fix that. Uh, so these are numbers taken in, uh, uh, from IBM, uh, from that report. <clears throat> and yeah, as you can see, just having a average breach, uh, average data breach in public cloud is $5 million of cost. That's a lot. So a short intro of me. Uh, my name is Matthias Lugberg. Uh, I am a founder of the company called Deva Solutions. And I'm a Microsoft uh, MVP since 2017. I'm also liking to, I like to exercise. So I'm really heavy into CrossFit and OCR races. So if you have any good idea about that, just let me know. <laughs> good place to go and talk to maybe. Uh, beside that, uh, I created yeah, DevOps because I really love the, the role of being a helping teams kind of excel and helping teams feel secure about what they're doing. And also I would help them to build better and safer solutions in the end. And that's one of the reasons why I'm standing here today. And the other one is uh, we are doing a service uh, today. We're doing a called DevOps Helium, uh, which is a review tool for Azure, so say. It's a continuous review tool. So we continuously scan environments. But let's go back to all these, this, this topic today and we go back to the breaches because we talked about how often they occur. It's also talked about that they are expensive. But the next more interesting thing would actually be where do they start? Because if we listen to media and we listen to what's going on, I guess you have a few ideas popping up in your head when I ask that question? Yeah, you do, good. But this is actually from that report again. Uh, let's go ahead and look into that. So 
these are the most uh, common uh, attack vectors that we have. And obviously, everyone in an organization is target of most of these uh, in the end. But from a developer and an architecture perspective, we are more into some of these. And that's what we're going to do. So we're going to look into cloud misconfiguration. And we're going to go into stolen and compromised credentials. So these are the two ones that we will focus on. And as you can see, they're also quite heavily actually uh, impact. So cloud misconfiguration is about 15% and stolen or compromised credentials about 18, 19%, something like that. So how do we do this in a way of kind of figuring out how this is, how this story goes? So let us start from the beginning. We will start from a, a go to cloud project. So we started that. And then we will traverse over time into something else. And we will accidentally encounter a lot of stuff along the way. That's my plan. So when we start our project in the beginning, uh, we actually need like a team or something. So let's just bump this up a bit. We have our on-prem stuff that we have before, and we're going to want to go to the cloud. You probably have done this trip already, and you probably had a bunch of people going on helping you doing this. So we're getting a lot of people, we're setting up things and we want to do how, how we should do this. Uh, the infrastructure people, they need to build up all their stuff. We have the security part uh, so that we need to be covered by security specialists. We got some managers and a CTO who wants to have everything aligned as well. And we also have us as developers in the end. This kind of comes up with a big initial start. So the starting part, uh, we have a clear checklist. Maybe we have an idea of what we want to achieve and we're going to build some infrastructure or a start solution. So in this case, we're going to do today, we're going to do a quite a secure solution. We will use an um, API management. We want to expose APIs. We want to use an um, we want to hide it in networks because we want to have networks security because we have a security person who's really into, into security. Uh, and we will go from there. But in order to kind of showcase this, let's jump into my favorite tool all the way through the whiteboard. So uh, if we're going to illustrate this, uh, I'll draw this a little bit uh, how it, so it's easy to talk about it. Let's just start off with a subnet for our uh, application gateway, which we will need in front of our uh, API management. I just assume you are aware of these kind of setups because these are really normal, really used ones. And then we just add a few more subnets over here. Let's just do a big one that we divide in two just for simplicity. So there we go. So into the first box, we add application gateway because we want to uh, we want to get get the buff. We want to get uh, OBUS protection and so forth. So therefore, this we we add that, and then we add an API management over here, and we are able to route traffic in here, and we will just scale off all the. The network security groups and routings and stuff like that. We just keep it for now. So this is kind of where we start off. Uh, we go into this case having this kind of basic setup. We have some subnets we can work in because we can want to build stuff. And we also have a, in the end, somewhere along the line, let's just draw a simple over here. We, we just assume we have something like a VPN or an express route. Let's just write an express route because it's much more fun. So we can co communicate to on-prem because on-prem we actually have stuff as well. Let's just draw that with a straight line. So we have that and maybe we have a database and then we have some other stuff here. No need to go too deep into that for now. So here we go. And uh, we can now actually route traffic from our repo management down to on-prem getting stuff up. But now the fun part starts. So now we actually start developing. And 
when we start developing, we kind of, if we go back to, to this whole project was a big one. We, we had a lot of people there. They were helping us we were getting information all over the place. When we start developing, we start getting a little bit more on our own because we have uh, we have we have a timeline, we have a chart, we have a budget, and so forth. Meanwhile, the other people have a lot of other stuff they also need to do. So we kind of jump in and doing that development thing. So let's just go back to the whiteboard again. We will add some services into this, and uh, I'm gonna use a yeah. Let's use a. I'm gonna just go ahead and be just for the sake of it. I'm gonna be a little bit. I'm gonna add stuff. You you'll see. So in in the first case, we need a we need somewhere to store files because that's kind of what we need to do. We need to store files somewhere. So we obviously add a storage account. That's what we need. We need to bring that up. And we also need some compute in order to actually go ahead and um, work with this. So we need something behind that APA management instance. Here we have some choices. Uh, I will do the very, very basic one. I will just add a function app over here. So we add a function and that will be then uh, VNet connected in through here uh, into this one. Let's just add a color for that. Let's just use orange because I'm used to using orange in that. So we're VNet connected in. So we can actually go ahead and connect in. With this function, we can then go in and we can actually go ahead and collect those files because they're on-prem. And we can compute with them and then we can store the files into the source accounts. That's fine, right? That's a good setup. And in the end, we could actually also go ahead and expose this in APA management if we wanted to. Let's just stop there uh, for, for a sec because we need to discuss some parts. When we're going out there, um, Oh, let's use the whiteboard again, by the way. Let's just go ahead because I want to talk about uh, the responsibilities here uh, that we've seen. So in the initial case, we had a lot of people there. They were there building stuff. We put up a, a map of networking and stuff like that. It was quite a joint responsibility to put all that up. When we come down uh, to developing things, uh, we are putting a lot of responsibility to the developer team because we have a good infrastructure set up and now it's up to the team to actually do things in this. So if I go ahead and add this and I would have even maybe even add a API management call down here to expose this because I want to expose an API in, in API management to someone to use. I wouldn't build stuff like this. But in the end, how these are configured and how these are done, it's mainly up to the team. Obviously we can take help from, from people, but it's it's mainly up to the team. And that's kind of what I wanted to just showcase when it comes to my next thing that I didn't even show because I just saw it there and that's responsibility. Because if we just look into cloud misconfiguration, which, which is a big topic and cloud misconfiguration is, I don't know if I can explain it all the way either, but I assume it would be like uh, all mistakes that we're doing or we didn't have the knowledge uh, for it all the way through. So we needed to, we did some stupid choices and so forth. But if you just look at the risks around this, there's about 90% of security professionals was back in 2020 actually were concerned that human error would be a problem in this case to expose the cloud data. And I kind of understand that risk because there is a lot of things we can do. As we've seen right now, you probably have been looking at my sketch and missing things there. And that's intentional, obviously, because I wanted to miss things. And so we need to kind of <clears throat> be aware of that, that there's a risk, there's a human error risk because we are doing this on our own. In, in Spain, there was a company, uh, a hospitality cloud platform, which means that they were using uh, 
hotels. They were exposing uh, data for host build, hotel, hotels. And they did a misconfiguration on an S3 bucket that accidentally caused 10 million files to delete. 10 million files just because of misconfiguration. I don't know what it did, but, and I'm not gonna go here and say, this is like the worst case, but I want to showcase this because I wanna show you some things we can do in order to actually move away from the, the possibility in one way of the human error. And also another one is like making sure we are taking our responsibility as developers so that we actually do the things we should do. Because if we just take a small thing like a storage account, which is probably the most boring resource in Azure of all, it still have a lot of stuff in it. And it has a lot of things that we can use. And by the way, the first, the, uh, if you haven't been aware, the S3 bucket that they used in this hotel chain is the same thing as a storage account in Azure. I just like Azure, so I like, want to showcase Azure instead. So if we just take this small storage account again, and we just go ahead and we start building these containers, which is called a, you can see that's files, uh, folders more or less. These containers have an, a level of um, access type, which means that they can even be private or they can be public access readable, or it could be readable from containers. So you can even search in it. You can even browse how many files there are. I'm just guessing now <clears throat> because I have no clue, but let's say they forgot about this and they just accidentally opened one of these boxes. So this box over here, which is the orange box, just accidentally went public. Uh, that's that's not so good, but it's also quite hard to see from the outside. So if you accidentally change something along the way and you actually do that and it's deployed, it's not that easy to see. Uh, because if you go in, you would actually need to have a, if you just jump into a, I didn't have a storage account ready. That was interesting. Let's just jump into a storage account and let's just see uh, here. If I have a container here, you can see that I have containers and I can create one and I can do my my stuff here. So if I go ahead and accidentally have the blob, I will get a warning, but I can do it. Uh, so open, let's just go ahead. It will still be there. I can see that it's, Anonymous access is, is blob, but it's not private, but it's not really much more that I see. Fortunately, we have some options here. We actually have a setting on storage account that is, um, oh, I don't remember the name. Let's go ahead and check it out. Let's take the name instead over here. So there's actually a setting here, which we can do, uh, which is called allow blob anonymous access here, as you can see. If this is enabled, I can actually do as I did, create a container that is open. But if I would do disable and I save, I will then not be able to create new ones. And I will also be that the ones I have created will, oh, so let's go to the containers again, will actually still say blob, but they will not be open. It will actually be closed and I will have this warning and I can't even choose now. So this will automatically make everything in this private without changing anything uh, without changing the access level, but it still will not be open for anyone to get. We're not able to read it anymore. So if you change that, make sure that your blob storage is not used anonymous uh, in, a, uh, in a way that you want to use it anonymous. So there's one thing we can do. Next thing is that if you've been working with uh, storage count, you know that we have, um, and can you just add open, uh, open and then we can add next is static keys. Oh, that was a bad writing static keys. So on a storage account, we, we can have, or by default, I would say we actually use uh, something called static keys. So we jump back into this one again, and we would then go to a, to 
yeah, access keys here. Uh, I will get my keys. And you can see this. I can actually see how long they were rotated and so forth, but this is still a key, a static key. There's a possibility to turn it off, turn this off as well. So we actually have this. Um, uh, oh, um, there we go. Allow storage account a key access. We can actually turn this off so they are not allowed. And then we can force our con user of um, of the storage account to actually use role-based access, which means that in this case, I can actually make sure that we need a managed identity over here. Let's do that in Jello. So I need to create a, a managed identity that actually have access over here. Again, I've been making progress to be changing this storage account into a more secure one, because if no more static keys is leaked, I'm really happy. And the last one, the next thing would be going back to that network thingy that we talked about in the beginning and start using like private endpoints, locking things down and making sure that our storage account is not uh, accessible from, from public. Be aware though, that even if you add this private endpoint, uh, you also need to go ahead and have, let's go to the networking page and there we go. So when you add that private endpoint connection, you need to do this disabled, but it will also cause that this is away from public internet, just so you know. But it would be nice, it will be very, very protected then, because then it will live inside of this particular sublet that we had it in, and not accessible any other way. Making sure that our function needs to go through the network and go to the storage account. So there are some steps we can do to increase this, quite a lot actually. Uh, and hopefully you found some, some ideas, either you knew all of this or you learned something new. And let's go back. So there's some, as you can see, there's some ways of doing this. So misconfiguration uh, is is important thing to do. Uh, because there's a lot of deployments going on with misconfiguration. And I think that's mostly because people are not adding too much and then maybe do manual steps behind, but don't do that. Let's, let's make sure that we actually use uh, the, the bicep or whatever you want to use, ARM or Terraform, whatever. Just make it sure that you use it all the way through and make sure that all of these small properties there. I know it's tough sometimes, but it will be very good for you in the long run. So the tricky one, network. I love this one. Because even if we lock things down, it's still things that we need to consider. And I can't say that this is exactly how it happened or anything. Uh, I will just use an incident that you guys probably are very well aware about uh, from in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, but I will showcase how this could be possible to do uh, and how it could be, what could happen. Even if we are doing all this work we've been doing now, for now, how could this even happen still? And that's the Optus Bridge, uh, which, as I said, you're probably very familiar with. Uh, and that, in summary, uh, is more or less that there were APIs published that weren't protected. And that's kind of the part I want to take into us because I have no intel into this at all. I'm just using it as a reference. So if we go back to this solution again, let's say we have done all this good. We go back, we actually make sure that our uh, function as well is protected via a uh, private endpoint. Uh, go ahead there. So and we we need some data we still have one area left that we need to kind of investigate and that's the api management because regardless of how good we are doing things on all of these levels https request will be allowed in 
because that's kind of the plan. We want to have HTTP request loading. That's the idea. So what we are doing in API management, when we are exposing APIs, that is really important. By default, API management comes with a subscription key, which is a base security. Uh, but you can also add a lot more. You can add uh, job token validation. You can use IP filter. You can even use basic authentication if you want to. You can use uh, client certificates. You can use a bunch of security mechanisms. Uh, but if you just go ahead and focus on, on the main one in the, in the top, you start from there. So there's actually a setting on our API, API that actually says subscription required. So there's a tick. We need to tick that box. This is usually if actually used. <clears throat> this is usually the case, but if you don't do that, it's actually open. I want to warn you about another one, which is one of those that we have been uh, actually encountered uh, when we've been out working uh, with different companies. So you're probably aware that we can use products in this as well so products is a way of grouping apis and that also actually have a tick for subscription required so if i'm gonna add that part let's use the purple so let's just say that i'm adding oh let's draw one one more api over here we'll tick the box in all of these but then let's just add this particular one in the end and in this case we also have the box but we didn't tick it for some reason Actually, the one I had was a course thingy, yada, yada. I'm not going to go there. But yeah, that's something they wanted to achieve. But that actually accidentally makes these two APIs open. So it's over, over routing that tick you actually do on the API. So it's really important to keep track of your products as well. I know Microsoft has done a good job actually adding uh, like a information on it now. So if you just go in and take a, a quick look, they've actually increased, uh, I think it's after this one. Uh, okay, management, let's go there. I think I have one over here. So this is the pro API management and then we go to the products. And I don't have that in this part. Let's let's just go ahead. No subscription. Oh, there it is. No subscription. Here it is. So this actually have, if you go to the settings, this actually has this require subscription unticked. And uh, if we go back to APIs, this will actually make sure that this echo API and the mandatory API is actually open. If we just go to the APIs and go to the uh, let's go to Echo API. I can just show you that inside over here it's actually shown. So here we actually get a warning, which is good. And we get this blue mark on it. So it's actually showcasing us that this is a description is setting to not required. Uh, so this is pretty new, but it's good actually. So here you can see if your API has that. But that's a dangerous thing because even if we are protected by the whole network part all over the place, we're doing everything by the book and then we just forget to end that up in the API. And when we have hundreds of APIs, it might be hard to actually overlook in a good way. Uh, but that's, that's, that's one way of how this actually could have happened. So, um, if we go back to this one, then let's talk about another one, stolen and compromised credentials. It's also a fun one. And hopefully, um, in this case, it's more of how we're managing things, I would say, um, because uh, this is getting inside even if things are protected. So let's just start off with like, sharing credentials or wouldn't leave in the company. And as a 
former consultant, which I was before, uh, I actually really disliked having all these keys going on because whenever you needed to develop something, even if it was Cosmos or it was Service Bus or it was Storage Account, you always had these keys all over the place and you always had them on your computer. So when you left, you could still do stuff to them if you wanted to. Uh, but obviously you wanted to delete all of them. But still, it's it's an... It's an unnice feeling to have things like that on you because you don't want to be the bad guy who accidentally leaked it somewhere. Uh, so I didn't like that and I was very, very keen on deleting everything right away just to make sure that I didn't have anything. Uh, but there's a good thing that we have been touching a little bit and that's actually removing all the static keys and start using role-based access a lot more. Because role-based access helps us <clears throat> not only on making for me i would say even making deployments easier and stuff like that but it's also enlightens more upwards that a user has access to this or that or a service has access to this and that and when i leave the company for instance if i my account gets terminated i can't have access to anything because i don't really have any access keys it was just my account that actually had access and it also helps a newcomer coming in because they don't need to be shared a lot of secrets. They can just start using things because they are in the right AD group, for instance, and getting the access they need. So uh, when it comes to services, uh, we've been touching this. We can use managed entities, which means that we can point, we can create an identity for a service. So in the in the function case, we actually can have an identity for that function. So in in our case over here, if we just go ahead and put the AAD or Entra as it will be soon, uh, but let's keep it at the AAD for now. Let's just have this function. And then we have, or let's just have me as a, there's me, and me. And then I have like a account of me in here as well, because I had a user account, which I can use. And this user account, I can then grant access to different resources. So I can then get access, uh, get access. And everything is controlled inside of this AD environment. Uh, we can do the same thing for functions. So we can ask this manage identity. So this is a manage identity of that function, which means that as your screen, these are connected and these are connected. No one knows my password and no one knows that function's password. The only thing we know is the ID, the same as for me. The only thing they know is the ID. But by that ID, I can grant access as well to the same things, to that storage account or to that, um, I don't know, whatever the resources you need, the service bus or the Cosmos DB or similar, you can use that. So this will grant you that access. And it can be the same for APA management, granting access to the function, because we can protect the function as well. So we can add a lot bunch of layers uh, of security uh, that actually will be needed to grant on, on different entry points. Uh, but this is the illustration of it. Uh, so the AAD, we can get that, uh, what do you call it? The, the user version of it, so we can have the user version of that function as well. And if we just look into how that will turn out from a developer perspective, uh, you see the image above, this is my local settings. So this is my settings uh, that I've had some project on. And you see this uh, service bus connection on the top one. Let's see if I get a mouse, there we go. And you see this one, this is a long one. This is the copied access key ver version. When I use manage identity, I need to change my service bus connection name a little bit, a little bit to under underscore fully qualified namespace, and then just add the namespace. So more or less the same thing. This will grant as much access as it does. If I'm doing development on my own, I as a user need to have access to that service bus and have the appropriate permissions on that service bus, obviously. And then when we go into running into a cloud, my function needs to have it, which means that in production, I don't have any access at all, which is awesome. I like that. 
Because then we don't accidentally check in stuff. We live forever in some sort of commit all the way back. So don't do that. And just be aware that there are scanners on like open GitHub repos that scans everything looking for that, that missed uh, checked in secret. So don't be a victim of that. Don't do that. Sometimes the role based access kind of got, I would say it got increased, invested in a lot after the Jupiter um, incident. So this is an example of where the vendor actually do something that is not good for us, more or less. So what happens is that by Jupiter, they accidentally managed to create a backdoor uh, into Cosmos DB so that, as you can see, this, this hacker was actually able to get the access key to more or less any Cosmos DB. Uh, so they could go out and collect the data from it. If you would have been using rule-based access, then it was, this was not an issue because the key is not valid in any way. And also if you were using network, you were protected as well. So it's those small things that kind of help you keep up. And even if someone else doing this issue, we're protected anyway. And that's kind of, kind of the idea by doing a lot of these things that we have been talking about now. It's not that I believe that we necessarily will do things, but accidentally things can come up and be in a bad way. And we can just help ourselves doing a little bit more, doing that extra tiny step and be better prepared for, for problems. Uh, another one is store credentials. And um, this was a big topic actually out there. Uh, making sure to have something good. So role-based access is good for they make sure that we don't store credentials unnecessary, uh, but if you do, things can go really south. So this is a, you might be aware of this, but the Uber breach that happened uh, last year, I think it was, uh, actually was because of that, because they were able to, they were actually able to social engineer a developer and being able to hack their VPN and get in. So that was the first part. But what they did after that was scan the machines that was available and they accidentally found, or accidentally, they found a PowerShell script with admin credentials stored in it. So even if the user that they, they were actually breached didn't have the credentials enough, they found a way to actually find more credentials. And that's very bad luck because they took them, they took over the whole place, more or less. And you probably have read about it as well. So make sure not to store too much and keep that uh, least privileged thinking all the way through. Another thing that's why I think this is a very important topic and why I want to bring this up is that the breaches are not going to stop. They're going to continue. And the problem is that we as organizations or, or organizations out there, or, or most of them actually lack the, the power they need. They, they lack, lack the skills, they lack the, the human resources they need, they probably need more. Uh, or as we say in this, if you can see if the, in this um, chart, you can see that are your security teams sufficiently staffed? 62% say no. And when I work with customer, I kind of see that they don't have the time to do everything. They have time to do a lot of things. But they don't have, maybe they don't have, the, I would say my my perspective is they don't have time for everything they want to have time for. So it's a lot of responsibility that flows over to development teams as we do now. And that's why I think this is a hot topic to talk about. Because all in all, it's a team sport. It is. It's not only security that is the thing, the, 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 what do you call it, the only one responsible. It's all of us in the end. And we all, all of us, we need to help out, we need to like, you know, get together and really help out and take our responsibility for the parts we're doing. If we're unsecure, talk to this guy and that guy. And making sure that both the progress before and also during and after is done. 
in a good way with our with every part doing their with every uh, what do you call it every people doing it. people doing everything they should or they could on their end because even if we have seen uh, issues coming in from the service providers uh, Gartner has spotted that cloud security failures will mostly be customers own fault in the future because cloud vendors are rapidly going ahead and say and, and closing those gaps and doing it good so there's a lot of stuff going on and you're probably thinking uh it'll probably have a lot of thoughts on your mind i hope so at least uh and if you if you just step back a little bit uh, we need to do some things we need to or what to do it more or less need to uh, I, what i would suggest you to do rather is like take ownership of the things that you have have and try to bake the responsibilities because everything in the cloud is more or less uh, a shared responsibility which is not so good so step up and take it uh, because infrastructure security development all of it kind of comes down and we have overlapping areas where we need to help each other out next thing would be to actually understand where you are and do that in a way where you are actually looking into what you are doing because being honest to yourself is more important uh, than anything else i would say in this case because closing <clears throat> closing a few things or putting up a notch here and there would be helping you a lot. And that's the next thing, start fixing up. If you have find critical things, hopefully you don't, but if you have done that, start fixing that. And the next thing is be persistent because we need to, we need to kind of do this in a long term. This is not just, um, that's, that's part of what I, why I illustrated the starting project where we had a lot of people attending everything because time goes and these people have their own schedule and their own things they need to do probably jumps in back and forth uh, asking for status and so but in the long run it's a lot up to us and it's a lot up to making sure that we're doing a good delivery uh, and it's 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 tough because we have deadlines to keep, we have stress, we have stuff at home or whatever mental stuff going on. So <clears throat> we need to be try to be persistent anyway. And we should use like tooling to help you out in this case. And there are some things available. Um, I would say one that I didn't add to this that we can start off with, and we can start off with Azure policies, but Azure policies is a way of actually defining rules inside of Azure that enforces things like enforces HTTPS on an API or TLS version, so forth. You need to do all this work alone. You need to set up this rule on your own, but there's a lot of work done, a lot of mallets that you can reuse. Uh, but that's one way. Uh, another way is using Azure Defender. So Azure Defender is or Defender for Cloud, maybe it's called these days, by the way. Um, I'm just using Azure Defender as a name <laughs> from my own. <laughs> so that's actually scanning the environment, working a lot of uh, logs uh, to make sure that you are protected. Uh, also look into files on, on services. I think they're on, on websites and everything, like scanning for, for things that's not supposed to be there. Uh, we can also use infrastructure as code scanning tools. So infrastructure as code, uh, that would be like scanning your templates before deploying. So your bicep or your Terraform. Uh, and the same goes there. They can find that you have, that haven't required HTTPS or the subscription required is not there set because you're deploying a product or an API. And the fourth one is that what we are doing. So this is our service. It's called Helium. And we scan Azure as well. Uh, we scan it from a configuration perspective, which means that we scan what's actually in the environment and we tell from that. Let's start with some demos. Uh, I have a demo of Azure policies and I want to showcase as well a little bit about what we talk about Helium. I don't have for the other two, unfortunately. So you, will, you can Google that. You can see stuff on that as well. So let's just start off with... Um, 
Azure Policies. So Azure Policies is actually in here. It's called Policy. Uh, so what it does is uh, it's actually doing this. Looks like this. You can create your policies in here, and you can then see how it goes. So you can see from my sake that I had a policy created for API management for Force HTTPS, and you can see that everybody 100% 30 of 30 is compliant. Yes, I'm doing good. So and I can do deep deep dive into this to find non-compliant, for instance. The really good thing about this is that I can enforce this. So I cannot create an API without HTTPS set on it. So it's really good for like making sure you are not deploying something you really don't want to. A lot, a lot of the times it's used for like not deploying a very expensive VM or, <laughs> or something like that. Uh, but it could also be used for this. It does require manual work though. So you need to create all of these rules uh, by yourself along the way. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, our, uh, let's see, I should have logged in before. This was interesting. Uh, yeah, let's go. There we go. Uh, so this is actually scanning the same thing. So it's more or less doing the same subscription that we're doing now uh, in here. So let's just go resources. You can see there's a bunch of stuff in here. And all of this is actually available here. So this is the contents of that. Uh, you see different uh, subscriptions here. I will not go too deep into this, uh, but here we can see this environment that we're doing. And we can actually see that I have this um, uh, changes here on my unsecure um, storage account that we have. So from just looking into this, we work with a level system to make sure that we keep levels, which makes it easier to uh, kind of help help our customer know where they are. So a level three is up to like public cloud, and then you go level five, then you're locked down. Uh, like public access is closed, and you have level four, which is networking. But here you can see that we are using latest TLS version. We have put HTTPS, very simple stuff. You should have that already. And then we have that blob access, and we want to make sure they're not allowing cores all the way through. And then on level three, we're making sure that you only use AD access, for instance, uh, or if you don't use ex at least access key rotations. The copy scope, uh, it's a bigger picture as well, but these are secure things that you can do. So if you have high security data that you need to be in, yeah, let's go to level five. If you are less, then let's go to maybe level two or level three. So this is a showcase. And this is done for. We are focusing on Azure, um, what's called Azure Integration Services, which is where we come from. So I come from integration space. Uh, so this is what we're doing in that. Uh, then the idea is to be able to, uh, by this, being able to say, hey, I have a level five requirement on this storage account because it's really important. And then as a developer or I can go in and see this, and I can also go in and get help. So if I want to see what this copy scope is, I can actually get an explanation about it. I can get how it's sold, uh, regardless from Bicep or ARM or scripting. And we also get the portal version. And this comes for everything that we do to help out, to make sure that we can do, developers can develop easily. Good. Um, I think that's all for me, actually, for now. So let's just say questions and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very um, much. Um, one question one I question have around the managed identity. Yeah. Do you use... Do you use System assigned, system assigned or, or user, or assigned, or assigned? user I actually use system assigned because user assigned is good. It's really good when it comes to a closed down environment and someone else needs to add the access and stuff. But it's also, yeah, it's a double edged sword, I would say. And because you can reuse the same credentials. So I usually use system assigned actually. But that also 
becomes a lot of identities in general. Yeah, that, yeah, um, that one, of um, one of the approaches I've, I've taken, taken is, is making sure, making that, sure my that my DevOps process, process assigns, assigns all the roles. All the roles access. Access. Exactly. And then you use user user access administrator on that one, at least, or yeah. owner if yeah. you don't have that already. Yeah, yeah. not owner, not but, owner user, but user, user access. User yeah. access. Yeah, that's a good way. I usually have that as well. It's nice. And be building it up in the bicep or in, in arm or whatever you yep. use. Yep. Mick or Dan, Mick or anything? Dan anything? Yeah, I was going yeah, to say, gonna say it. We, got, we got a terrible, yeah, we got a terrible echo, by the, echo by the way. Yeah, I know. Hold on. Uh, Go ahead. That might, that might, I think that might solve it now. <laughs> um, yeah, we had a client where uh, they they didn't trust the developers to give them the ability to assign roles. Uh, so they rather we use the user assigned uh, managed identity for everything, just one. Because if we if we had to do system assign, you know, every time we had the provision, we'd have to ask them to create the account for us. And and yeah, <laughs> it's a pretty backwards way to do things. Yeah, that that kind of is a double edged sword, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> because if you do it like that, it's like it's a one 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 identity to rule them all. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think. Uh, look, it was a great presentation. Loved it. Um, I think, you know, depending on what the service is, uh, you know, system assigned suits. If you're going to provision it, set it up, and say, hey, you know, this is going to be part of our deployment, such as. You know something that key vault's going to interact with all the time etc but then other services such as container apps and and so on where you might be deploying oh hold on going to change it going to you know reprovision it and so forth you don't want to go through that system assigned uh managed identity process all the time and, and that's usually the last thing you you forget about uh so you know having a user assigned identity at that point I think you know really it's 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 really helpful. I think it's a, a bit of a mix um, as to you know really what you're doing and how yeah because we're we're sort of all pushing towards serverless right we're pushing towards just on demand. I want to spin this thing up on demand. I don't want to be paying you know paying coins paying money for for things that aren't in use. And then when I spin it up, maybe it's going to get really busy and and I want to be able to have that that kind of you know top end scale stuff and maybe i've got yeah for example a, a ticket a ticket site that that you know a show comes into town it gets really busy it backs down when they're gone you know that kind of stuff so we really want sort of this on demand piece and and not have to worry about anything else outside of our developer realm we want to you know solve the business problem and not have to worry about the infrastructure problem where you know hence hence the whole notion of of infrastructure as code and code deployment and bicep and whatever else have, has evolved in in recent times because we just want to be able to point point shoot click my, my new environment set up in a different region as well so you know we, we've got this all, a whole multi-tier thing and and you know and, and i think that's a really powerful feature in azure having these multi-regions that for, for backup, for redundancy, for load balance, for, you know, CDN type closeness of, uh, you know, proximity of service to to whatever that other endpoint is or whether it be a user. And, you know, a lot of the times we do get caught up into, you know, these kind of, and I won't call them semantics because I think they're really important to solve, but we don't actually... We, we don't actually take advantage of the full capability of that cloud environment and where, you know, we're, we're forever going back to, you know, that server in the first thing that you deployed in in Europe or, or in, you know, wherever else it is in Asia, even though you've got a global footprint, why is it going back there? Oh, you know, it's it's implicitly something to do with that service whether it be a, a database or whether it be, you know, something else. And and they all sort of promote this, this you know, multi-region type aspect. So I think, you know, I think absolutely you bang on, Matthias, in, in being able to simplify that deployment, being able to say, hey, you know, treat this, this part of your deployment 
uh, this way and treat your other part that way. And then, you know, in, in what you're saying, uh, I, I, you, you know, a lot of what you said resonated with me where people are, are, are moving to different roles, they're busy, uh, it's a joint effort, and, and you often don't get that joint, co uh, you know, cohesion between, oh, you're a developer, give us your, you know, give us your app and and sort of we know how to deploy it. Containers are a classic one for, you know, you lob it over the fence and they're like, well, why did you use that base image? You should have used this base image, just the one, you know. And there's a whole bunch of, of you know, logistics and, and things like that that need to get on there. Uh, and, and, you know, I think... I think from from the solutions that I've seen and worked on probably in the last you know two and a half years three years they they they're more than just hey here's a website in a database right it's, it's like here's a static site in a database or or a you know Azure table or whatever you're doing Cosmos DB you mentioned am I going to use that or am I going to use a NoSQL somewhere else so suddenly you know you've got more than two components in your solution exactly. And it's, you know, it's spaghetti junction and and you, you throw in e-commerce in there and it's and it's WooCommerce and it's this and it's that. And there's something else over here to translate the orders from there into, you know, another ERP system. And and before long, you end up getting, you know, spaghetti junction all over the place. So having where, where I, you know, where I really liked was just having your tool then be able to go, because the question is, Who's going to look up, you know, who's going to make sure that we're adhering to our standards? We want to be able to put a hand on heart and say maybe, you know, maybe we're dealing with medical information or maybe we're dealing with financial information. And and we all open the doors, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and, and it's all had the whole, uh, uh, you know, compliance checks and everything else going through it. But what happens in six months' time? Well, what happens in nine months' time or a year's time when we've made four or five different updates, major updates? Is it still kosher? Yeah, exactly. Is it still on, you know, are we still compliant? And and so having these actively, you know, these active tools, like, you know, going out there and saying, hey, you know, here's all your green bars. This one's not compliant anymore or here's a problem. But then even being able to go in and, and I think, you know, as you're saying, all our services need to be HTTPS. And, and you might think that that's a frivolous thing to be talking about in today's day. It's 2023. We were talking about this, you know, 15 years ago, right? But you'll be so surprised the number of that, oh, well, it works on my machine and it goes out there using HTTP and we're, we're fronting it behind some, you know, maybe APIM, maybe something else, and it kind of does the magic for us. But, oh, we forgot there's there's a team that makes a direct call into that HTTP service. And why didn't you use APIM? Oh, because we want to do it. You know, it's just the evolution of it. But being able to go in and, and say, turn it all off and make it secure from day, day dot or give, you, give yourself the best chance of making it secure is, and, and you know, it's not a perfect science, but if we're actively looking towards making it more secure each and every day, then it's going to be a good thing. Exactly. Exactly. So that was, so a, that was, a, that, that was that, a long way of saying, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <clears throat> now, I, I agree. And that's the, the biggest thing I would say from that is take advantage of making sure that you are giving yourself the possibility to do things good because that's what you want to do in the end in the end you want to deliver something good and you want to deliver something that you can like be proud of in the end and just move to the next thing now just a, a, quick, just a quick question, question. Can, can we get, get details, details on your, on your solution? solution yeah definitely so now or do you want to have it later or <laughs> i'm not sure if it's in a slide or, or somewhere bill <clears throat> ah, so what we do is more like we scan environments. So what we do is we have a, we actually go ahead and so uh, scanning your, your environment. And then we have these checks as we talked about, uh, and we kind of go ahead. Uh, let's see if I have a, uh, I don't know if I have the time for it. I'm not sure. I'm, I, what, I, what I, guess, I guess how do people get engaged? Oh, the best part would be contact me. Uh, that would be the easiest part for now. 
Yeah. Uh, we but still don't right. have anything on Marketplace or anything. Sorry for that, but uh, contact me at oh, uh, Marketplace. Isn't an easy, uh, easy uh, yeah, isn't an easy feat, my, my friend. I know, but I wanted it. It would be so much more easy. <laughs> uh, and I think from that part, it's. Uh, I think I had my uh, my. Uh, if I go ahead and just. Oh, you have my screen there, Bill. If you want to hold on. It up. Hold on. You can even you can contact me on either social media or you can find me at devop.solutions. Uh, I even have a mail, Matthias at devop.solutions as well. Beautiful. Uh, I can add a link to the bottom of the bottom description. There we go. I put it in the chat as well. Or it was a private chat, so that would make not up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I can add, I'll add the, the details to that. Perfect. So thank so, you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a really fun show. And thank you for the talking afterwards. Really nice. <laughs> yeah. so I'm, going to end, I'm going to end the live stream. Thanks, everyone, Thanks for, everyone attending. for attending. Thanks thank great. you for having me. <clears throat> thank you for looking.